Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Growing Band Director. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a good friend of mine, Mr. Christopher Rivera from the Norwalk High School Band. Chris, why don't you tell us something about yourself? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Um, so my venture into band and percussion specifically is a little different than a lot of people. A lot of people don't know where I actually got started. Um, I started in third grade as a violin player, and then I started to teach myself piano from that point on. And I did strings through middle school and through high school and a little bit in college. And it wasn't until the summer going into my freshman year where the band was going on a trip to Arizona. And some of my friends said they had to go to a meeting over the summer about this trip they were doing for band. And I said, well, I'll come along. I have nothing to do. Seemed pretty cool. So I uh, went up to the director at the time and said, uh, you know, I'd like to join the band. He said, what do you play? I said, I play the violin and the piano. And his response was, well, we don't have any of those, but you can learn to play in the front ensemble. I said, what's that? So just show up and, and you'll learn what it is when you show up. So that's kind of uh, how I got into the band world. And then um, throughout high school, I got into um, playing percussion, also started playing with the symphonic band, playing trumpet a little bit, went to Western Connecticut State University to major in music education. After that, I went right on to grad school full time at UConn and got my degree in music theory. Since then, um, I've been fortunate enough to be on the WGI advisory board for several years over the past 15 years. I'm the percussion director for Musical Arts Conference, and uh, I've done a lot of judging for both marching band and winter percussion, various places around the country. And um, it's a really fun thing that we get to do, especially in the world of winter percussion. My students have been able to have a lot of success with it. We've won six, seven WGI medals. And, and I always say my students, not me, because it doesn't matter who you have in front of the group. It's the students that make the group. So here at Norwalk High School, you know, we've been pretty successful and um, looking to keep it going strong. Great. Well, you have a great ensemble. Maybe in a little while, we'll play a little excerpt from your uh, show rewritten. So sure. everybody can see that. So first of all, would you explain to our audience, what is indoor percussion or winter percussion? Yeah, so the the name indoor percussion, winter percussion, kind of interchangeable. I I always try to tell people there are three main categories of indoor winter percussion. You've got the concert percussion, like a traditional concert percussion ensemble. Then you've got what some people call either a standstill or a festival ensemble, which includes marching percussion instruments, um, you know, snares, quads, bass, etc. But they don't march. And then we have the traditional uh, marching ensemble, which is full concert percussion, front ensemble percussion, uh, battery percussion, and it includes the marching element. So those are really the three main categories of the indoor winter percussion world. And it's still fairly new. I mean, marching band's been around forever and ever, but winter percussion, you know, it, it it's it's still new to a lot of people. It's not as traditional as marching band is still to this day. Amen. So could you give us a comparison of the benefits of a moving indoor percussion scenario and a concert or a concert indoor scenario with marching percussion? Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's some pros and cons to whichever style you choose to pick Um, with the concert percussion. If space is a problem for you, concert percussion should be the way to go. You don't need to worry about space. You can rehearse in a hallway. You can rehearse uh, in the band room, in an orchestra room, in a choir room. You don't need a ton of space. With the standstill, if you want to 
start slowly involving the marching percussion instruments you don't need room to march around so you need a little bit bigger space perhaps even a stage works well if you can get there and then if you choose to go the full-blown marching route then you would need um, some room to be able to move and play at the same time but in terms of benefits i think the benefits are sort of the same regardless of which route you choose and the way I do it here at Norwalk High School is everything's cyclical. Every ensemble and every group we have benefits every other group. So marching band benefits concert band, concert band benefits jazz, jazz benefits winter percussion, winter percussion benefits musical theater. So everything is part of this cyclical constant growth that we try to have here at the high school. Um, some Another benefit is recruitment we are always as band directors and percussion directors trying to recruit new members into our groups, whether it be concert band, marching band, winter percussion, winter guard. And I found that winter percussion specifically is a great way to get new members into your ensembles and not just winter percussion, but then they want to be part of other ensembles too. So every year for our indoor winter percussion, we end up with two, three students from outside of the music department who have never done music before that want to come join Winter Percussion because their friends are there. And then they end up having a really good time there. Then they want to join concert band and, and marching band. So it's a great way to uh, recruit new members. It's also a great way to reach out to the middle schools. We've had a lot of success with having eighth graders occasionally in our programs. And once, once you get some eighth graders involved in the high school programs while they're still in middle they have a good time that spreads like wildfire and all their friends want to do is is join too because they hear about how much fun it is um i think almost every high school band director can say there's always way too many percussionists for the amount of parts that there are for the repertoire that you're playing in concert time and that's just the way it is even if there's five or six percussion parts a lot of the times band classes have seven, eight, nine or more percussion players in them. And you can only double and triple concert percussion parts so much be before it becomes too much. You know, if you're going to a, a festival to be raided and you have three mallet players in the back doubling the flute two part, well, that might not be the best decision to make. But if you're just doing a concert at your school, no one's going to judge you for doubling and tripling some parts. So it's a way to also give those full-time percussion players more to do and and they just need to understand during the concert time you might not be playing 100 of the time but during the winter indoor percussion season um you you will be playing and and i would say the last thing i want to add in about some of the benefits is it will teach some of your wind players to become better rhythmically because Typically, percussion music tends to be a little bit more rhythmically complex than, say, you know, a third trombone part. And we've had a lot of success every year with a typical ensemble size for us in the winter season is maybe 40 students. And really only 25 of them are full-time percussion players. The other 15 or so are either brand new or they come from the, from the wind section. So they get to learn another instrument. They get to get really good on rhythms. Their sight reading gets better. And like I started off saying, everything just circulates back around and it makes the overarching um, music program at your school just, just better. Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. But I think our listeners need to know one thing about you. A lot of times when we get special guests to come and speak, they talk about one area that they teach. Could you tell us all the courses and things you teach at Norwalk High School on an annual basis? Sure. So we have a very comprehensive program here at Norwalk High. And under my umbrella, there are three concert bands. One is an honors ensemble. We usually have one or two jazz ensembles, depending on the year. I direct the fully student um, pit orchestra for our spring musicals. We have uh, the marching band, obviously, we have the winter percussion, and we also have uh, winter guard. Sometimes we have two winter guards. So there's um, quite a bit always happening at Norwalk High School. Thank you. I just wanted to make everybody, our listeners know that you don't just do percussion ensemble, you do everything as well as 
typically writing the percussion book for marching band and writing the entire percussion book for your winter percussion ensemble. Right. Yep. Yep. And you all, if I recall from our previous conversation, not only do you teach the the uh, pit orchestra of, of students for the school musical, but you manage and run and direct the entire uh, functioning of the school musical, not direct in the sense of students, but taking care of all the logistical background and everything. Yeah, I take care of all the production aspects. I'm also the producer of the show. So dealing with parents and volunteers and supplies and payroll and paying the bills, all that, all that fun stuff that everybody always loves to volunteer to do. Yes, they do. So you've given us the pros and the cons and everything. How do you think one should create a winter percussion program? If we're, and I'm going to address this if people are starting from scratch, because if you've already got an existing program, hopefully you kind of have the track that you're on and you know what you're doing. But I would say that you need to start small and develop short-term and long-term goals. Everybody likes to watch YouTube and watch the Chino Hills and the Dartmouths and those kind of world-class groups and say, I want to do that. It's never going to happen unless you start small. You have to start small and figure out what's your goal for this year, what's your goal for next year, what's your goal for five years down the road. Because if you don't plan it out and map it out, it's probably not going to happen. My suggestion would be to start with a concert program first. Develop the skills, get the kids interested, and then maybe move on to the festival um, version where you start adding the marching percussion instruments. And then after maybe two years, when you have everything solidified and you've figured out all the other logistics that go into it in terms of rehearsal space and scheduling and parent volunteers, then you can take that step up to the marching group. I'm very fortunate here that I'm able to have a staff that works with me. Not every director is able or can afford to hire staff to work with them for a winter percussion season. But to develop a program, you have to have a plan. You have to figure out all the logistics. And you have to put a staff together and make sure you get the parent support too. Because the parent support is what's going to really help you when you decide to take that next step and become competitive. You're going to need parents to drive equipment trucks. You're going to need parents to move things. You're going to need parents to build props and, and buy things that you need. So really, it's a lot of planning that goes into it if you want to establish a program. And, and that's in addition to making sure you get the, the instruments that you need. And, you know, percussion instruments, are, but there are ways to do it. I've seen some groups take out a lease program so they can buy a complete battery set and pay it back over four or five years. Uh, drum corps are always selling used equipment online. Other schools are selling used equipment online. You know, Facebook is a great resource if you need a, a vibraphone or something and you can't afford to buy a brand brand new one. You can definitely find some used gear out there online um, that will help get you started. Great, thank you. So, let's say we're at the beginning of the season. How do you begin your design of your show? Or how would you recommend people begin the design of their show? I think you, you really need to get your staff together and have a conversation about what some of your strengths and weaknesses for that season might be. Uh, maybe your front ensemble is going to be super, super strong and your battery is going to be a little younger. Maybe it's vice versa. But in order to start the design process, you need an idea. Um, I've seen groups pick a piece of music first and then design a show around that. I've seen groups come up with a concept first and then fit music around that concept. I've seen a group even, they base their show on a poem. So the poem was the design impetus, which then the music and the visual got designed around. Some people come up with this grand scheme for these you know, over the top props that they wanna use, but they don't quite know what the show is or the music will be yet. So some people des design with the props first. Um, that's kind of your first step is to figure out what what your your impetus is, what's your idea. For me here at Norwalk High and pretty much at least probably for the last 10, 12 years, we've always decided to do original music. And that helps us out in two ways. Number one, 
we can easily add, change, delete, edit anything that we don't like because we put out, you know, 30 seconds of music before and we say, well, this, this just isn't working. We need to total rewrite. And, you know, a couple of days later, we can have that. Whereas if you buy music, it's a lot harder to do that. The other positive to writing your own music is that it can be 100% at the level the students need it. Sometimes when you hire other people to arrange for you, it's too hard. It's too easy. They don't know what kind of dexterity the marimba players have with four mallet passages. But when you know your students, you can customize the writing so you know it's at the level they want it to be. And you also don't have to deal with the big hassle of copyright and permission to arrange um, permissions and fees because those those do get um, quite expensive. But in terms of the design, I also want to say there are some good products out there uh, published products that you can buy. There are some products and there's several good companies out there which come with drill and music. Um, last year, we actually did decide to purchase a show last year because of coming out of COVID. We thought it would be much more beneficial for us to be in with the students teaching all the time rather than us as a designer sitting at a computer, writing music, putting dots down and just we knew we needed to recover from the COVID, so we wanted to make it as productive as possible. So last year we did purchase a show, which was the first time we've ever done that. But going forward into the 2023 season, we will uh, be doing our own again, like we usually do. And are you, well, let me back up. So that's the music part. So say you get your music all picked and everything's good to go there. What do you do about your visual part of your program? So we have a visual designer that we use. We've used him for the past several years now. He's awesome. Everybody should find someone that they can count on and they know they're going to get a good product from. And we, in terms of designing, we have conversations with everybody together all the time from the design staff. It's not just the, the music guys talking, the visual guys talking. Every meeting we have is with our drill designer, with our writers. We also include... Um, our graphic artist. And if that's something that your group can afford, I would highly recommend it. That way there's a cohesive look between costumes, the printed floor, drum wraps, if you choose to use them, prop design, coloration. So we have conversations with all of us all the time and it's totally collaborative. It's not one side of the equation telling the other group, this is what we're doing. Now you figure out your part of it. It's just constant conversations and ideas and brainstorming off of one another. So when do you start doing all this? Because if you're in the middle of marching band, I assume all summer you're working on getting the marching band product going. And then right after marching band ends, you get into the holiday music program. And then as soon as the holiday music program ends, then you're into indoor percussion. So when do you get time to do all this? It's hard. It takes a lot of uh, figuring out. I think we all, as soon as championships is over in April every year, we we kind of start thinking about it on our own. You know, did did anything we saw at in Dayton spark an idea? Did something we come across spark an idea? But we really don't start putting anything on paper, to be honest with you, until the beginning of November. So we'll spend September and October having a bunch of Zoom meetings and conference calls. And it's, it's really not till November that we really start putting down dots and music with the goal of starting to learn music and drill for the first week of December. And that gives us December, January, and then a week or two into February before the competitive season. And because that's the way we do it here, based on our schedule, the students know they don't have three months to learn music. They have to learn it quick. And they, they take that and they do well with that. Do you find that that, because of the short period between one and the other and having to move forward, that it advances their reading skills and their technical skills? Yeah, it does, because we we don't have the time to show them note by note, measure by measure. Um, literacy is a huge thing for me here, even outside of the winter percussion program, just in my band program here. Literacy is probably the most important thing we stress all year. Every year I tell my freshmen when they come in, 95% of you are probably musically illiterate right now, and that's okay. We're going to fix that. We're going to fix it fast. 
So we start with everything but from making sure we know our lines and spaces, rhythms, key signatures, articulations, everything. Because the point is we should be able to hand out music, whether it's concert band, jazz, you know, winter percussion, and the kids should be able to figure it out on their own. They shouldn't have to be spoon fed every measure, which that happens a lot of places. And then it, it just delays the learning process. And with an activity like this, that's so dependent on time, they have to be able to do it on their own. Okay. So you briefly skimmed across this. If I like, we could talk about it a little bit more. I know you go heavily into costuming, props, floors, skins, and other devices. How do you go about that? I know you use your graphic designer, as you said before, but what generates the ideas and what uh, costs and stuff and sources and stuff like that? Sure. So there are a lot of companies that put out these products. You can get floors from a lot of different digital printers. Pretty much now everybody uses a digital floor. No one goes out with 10 gallons of paint and a bucket on a Saturday in a gym and paints a floor anymore, like, like back in the day. So you can source that out really well. On to percussion is really the, the go-to source. If you want to use drum wraps, their product is really great. Um, the one thing I would say is you want to make sure that everything is cohesive. You don't want one person to design your floor, another person to design your costumes, another person to side your drum wraps, another one to design the color scheme on the props. You really do want to make it look like it's all coming from the same product and not uh, pieced together. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. I've seen groups go out there with tons and tons of over the top props and every light up device you can see and, and drum wraps and everything you can imagine. But at the end of the day, those kids, they can't play and move well. So use the, the props and the floors and all the accessory things if they are going to enhance your program. Don't use them just because you can use them because they're pricey, they're not cheap. Uh, a floor is anywhere between 3,000 and 4,000, depending on how what the sizes you get. And people use different floors. For us at Norwalk High School, uh, last season, our costumes for about 40 students was about $12,000. Now, that's all custom. Sure, you can buy stuff out of a catalog that would probably be half that price. And I would recommend that to people because especially if you're starting off, your, your budget's probably going to be small if it exists at all. So you, you definitely want to make sure that you you set a budget, too. That's one of the big things. If you're planning on starting a winter percussion program, do a budget so you know where your funding's coming from. Figure out if you're going to charge dues to your students, how much they're going to be. Be transparent with all that right up front with them, with their parents. Have a parent meeting. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I can't say that enough. But all these things cost a good amount of money. And you want to make sure you budget for them. And they're not all necessary. There are plenty of groups that go to WGI championships and, and they're in the top, top five of their class without props, without anything that lights up, without anything crazy on their drums. So I, I always say, think about a, a show that might do a winter percussion program about New York City. You could put some flats in the back that are painted like a New York City skyline. Okay. Is that going to get you anything higher on your score? Absolutely not. If they just sit back there and they don't do anything, the, the judges really don't care about it. You're going to put those props out there, make them functional, make it so they're used. Um, maybe you want to do a costume change. You can hide people behind there. Maybe you want to thin out the texture on the floor. You can get rid of some people behind a prop. Then they're being used in a functional way not just, hey, we're doing a show about New York City and we have a skyline back there and you didn't give us any credit for that. You're not gonna get any credit for that. So those are the kind of things that we think about when we start the design process in terms of tangible things, floors and props and, and costumes and drum wraps. Yeah, I think you covered the, the other question we were gonna talk about was the typical costs because you, like you said, you could go buy custom or you could buy catalog bought or you could just find what you need and use it. Um, and I think the thing that was very well stated was that teaching comes first, props and junk come second. 
the teaching comes first the the advancement of the uh, the ability to read on the part of the children the advancement of the children being able to move and play the repertoire is the foremost important part um so constraints you've got say you've got your winter program and now you have constraints within the school community what kind of constraints have you run across and what have you done to get around them or work with them yeah so i would say in the percussion world the biggest constraint is if you're going to well aside from money money's the biggest constraint no matter what program you're doing whether it be marching band concert band jazz whatever that's always number one but in the winter percussion world one of the biggest issues that people come across is finding rehearsal space at norwalk high we don't usually ever rehearse with the front ensemble and the battery together because we don't have space to do that. Usually on Saturdays, we get into our gym after 12 o'clock. And that's our one time during the week to put full ensemble together with front ensemble and battery. During the week, during our usual typical <laughs> rehearsals, um, the front ensemble will rehearse in the auditorium and the battery will rehearse if they're rehearsing music, they're rehearsing the band room. But if they're having a visual rehearsal night, we don't get to use the gym during the week. So we go down to our cafeteria and the cafeteria is two flights of stairs down on the opposite end of the building. So bringing front ensemble down there is really not an option. Um, and then people say to me, well, doesn't your cafeteria have pillars all throughout it? And I say, yeah. And they say, well, how do you, how do you rehearse a marching group when there's pillars everywhere? Well, we've gone down there and gridded it out to the to the inch. We know exactly where those pillars are. And our drill designer enters those on Pyware. So when he does the drill design, there are no issues. You just march around a prop, I mean, a pillar, and no one watching our programs would ever know, hey, they never stand in that spot because there must be a, something there where they rehearse. Nobody ever knows. You know, we take up a lot of space. So the, the logistics of finding rehearsal space is always a big one. I would suggest that people become very friendly with their athletic director. I'm very fortunate here at Norwalk to have an amazing athletic director who we collaborate with each other all the time on different projects. And I find out what the gym schedule is so I can get in there whenever we can. Um, but also people have to get creative. Maybe your group doesn't rehearse altogether like mine. Maybe they only get together once a week or once every two weeks. It'll work. Trust me. Trust the process. It'll work. You might want to also, if finding rehearsal space is an issue, reach out to the local elementary and middle schools. They might have um, a gym or, or some kind of large space, even a cafeteria that tables can be moved that you might be able to use um, during the week if you need some rehearsal space, if you choose to do um, a marching group. But at the end of the day, communication is key. You have to communicate with, with your custodians, with your athletic director, with your other colleagues, and you just have to know what you can do and when you can do it. That's that. Those are great ideas. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure people realize this, but with, within Pyware, you can set a setting that says these are impenetrable objects on the field and they can't be gone through so that it makes it so that the writer can avoid that stuff. That That's a, that's a great idea. And um, uh, you, what I don't think people realize is the enormity of your school. Your school is almost a quarter mile from the top where you are in the music wing down to the furthest end of the science wing. And it's four stories, five stories in one place throughout the whole place. So it's a long distance to uh, lug all that stuff. And plus, if I recall correctly from talking to you before, as well as the auditorium being used during that period of time for winter percussion front ensemble, there's the musical rehearsing at the same time. Right. So that's where you have to have good communication with your other colleagues because uh, they're going to have uh, theater productions and musical productions going on and they want to use that auditorium and I want to use that auditorium and it's just about communication. Okay, what time are your rehearsals starting? What time is yours ending? Okay, we'll come in right afterwards. Okay, we'll make sure we're out on time. You know, you just have to have those conversations and be transparent and make sure you communicate with everybody. And do you find that you have 
to work at communication with the, your other colleagues within the building other than the athletic department? For winter percussion, um, sometimes. I mean, I like to collaborate with, we have a digital media academy here, which is great to help get some PR out and, you know, come they want to come videotape rehearsals and competitions and do stories about it. And then they play them on our once a week news broadcast that we do here at the high school. So that's a great way that other students get exposed to the program that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity. And we get some new members that way. Uh, but, you know, your custodians, be good friends with them. Th th this is advice for any band director. Your custodians and your secretaries need to be your best friends. You need to know that you can go to them, ask questions. They can help you out. Schedule your space. Uh, every year I give our, our school secretary the dates from December through uh, April when I'm going to be using the cafeteria. So no one else will book the cafeteria. I give them the auditorium dates so they know. The custodians know if I need to hire someone for a late Saturday, they know I'll give them a ring. But you definitely want to make sure you you talk to people as much as you can so they're aware of what's going on. Yeah, communication is the goal. And communication, you, you'd mentioned briefly about with parents. How do you create that line of communication with parents for whether it be winter percussion or your concert bands, your jazz ensembles, your winter guard, your marching band? I do a weekly email. I try to do one email a week because when I get four or five, six from my own kids school, I look at the first one or two and then the ones that come after that, I go, okay, well, it's probably the same stuff. So I try to limit the amount of emails I send out. Also, you know, we have a large Hispanic pop population. So every email I send out is in English and Spanish. We try to have meetings once a month with the parents to keep them updated on what's going on. But it's it's important that the kid the parents are involved, and the more that you can meet with them, communicate with them, the more they'll want to be involved, and then the easier your life is going to be in the long run. Um, when do you start winter percussion officially, and what kind of weekly schedule do you have? So for our schedule here for winter percussion, we usually we usually give the students one week off after marching band because we're nice like that. So the marching band's usually over here in the Northeast the first weekend in November. So we give them one week off after that. And then we start up our usual routine, which is Tuesday nights from five to eight, Thursday nights from five to eight. And Saturdays, we come in every Saturday at 9 a.m. And sometimes it's nine to one, sometimes it's nine to four, sometimes it's nine to six. And about three or four times during the season, we do full camp days, nine to nine. The camp days are long and tiring, but the, the kids love them. We arrange for parents to make dinner, like a buffet-style dinner, so the kids don't have to worry about dinner. It's a time for them to bond with one another. But that's our schedule. And, and the one thing I would recommend to people is sometimes, you know, directors and instructors say, oh, we need, we need nine to nine every weekend. Do you really? Or, or could you get it done in a nine to four? I don't like keeping my students at rehearsal longer than they need to be. So we always plan ahead. What's our goal for the week? Okay, can we get it done in a nine to four? Yeah, we can. Let's not say nine to six and then just keep playing eight on a hand for an hour and a half just to kill time. So always, you know, work your schedules out so they're, everybody's time is valuable, so it's not being wasted. Thank you very much. I, I think that um, one of the things that I've noticed from observing your program over the years is that you watch other schools some other schools have a very dominant percussion program or they'll have a dominant marching program or they'll have a dominant concert program or a dominant musical theater program and i think the one thing that i can say as an observer of you is that you have no dominant program all your programs are interwoven so that everything works out well for everybody and everybody gets an opportunity to do everything throughout the school year and that your percussionists are not all percussionists in winter percussion. Some of them, as you said before, are, your, are horn players, or they could be string players, or they could be guard performers, and uh, they just choose to try out for that. Do you have tryouts to get into winter percussion? We do have tryouts. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and the tryouts are really for one purpose, to make sure we don't have more students than we can fit on a bus to go to Dayton. In all the years I've been doing this, We've had to cut people maybe mm, three, four out of the 
15 that I've been here because it just, we can't simply fit that many students on a bus with staff, with chaperones. If it weren't for that, we would take any kid that wants to come and work hard, we would take. But with this type of activity, since we do compete at the WGI World Championships every year in Dayton, we're limited to the amount of people that we can fit on a bus. Does WGI limit how many students you have can have participating in the open class? You know, it's a good question. I'd have to go back and look at the rule book again. There's been some changes, I think, over the years with that. And I'm not quite sure what the most current um, regulation is on, on ensemble size. Because I, I remember back 13 years ago that it was like 30. You could only have 30 kids. But uh, as you said, I think things have changed dramatically. Because if we look at some of our larger ensembles, there's a cast of characters out there that you can't even imagine how they get all those kids to and from one site or the other. Yeah, it's definitely more than 30. Um, one other thing I wanted to add about scheduling is get some type of online calendar, whether it's a Google calendar, whether it's something, and put everything on that calendar from day one. That way, when you start day one of auditions, the, the students and the parents can look at that calendar and understand what the commitment level is. That way they can't say, well, I didn't know we had to be here every Saturday. No, you did because we talked about it at the first rehearsal, the calendar's online. So before you start your season, put every rehearsal, every competition, everything on an online calendar so people can check it out and, and it would be it's a great resource for them. So say you have a child who says, well, I'm not coming Saturday. And they don't have any really legitimate reason not to come, except they said they're not coming. How do you handle that? I don't come across that problem very often here because of the culture that we've established. The kids that are here know what it takes and they know the expectation. And the expectation is that you're going to be here. I joke around with the parents a lot of the times. And I say, the only thing I'm going to excuse your kids for, especially on a show day is a wedding or a funeral, but because they know that it's, it's a group effort and everyone needs to be present all the time, whether it's rehearsals or shows. Fantastic. Well, I'll be back to you in about a minute or so, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Chris. Yep. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.